Chris Hensley is a registered representative of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer member of FINRA, SIPIC, investment advisor representative of Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Houston First Financial Group are not affiliated. The Houston Midtown Chapter of the Society for Financial Awareness presents Money Matters with your host, Christopher Hensley. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Money Matters on KPFT Houston. Got a great show lined up for you today. And it's not you, it's the workplace, women's conflict at work, and the bias that built it. Kramer and Harris argue that these conflicts are rooted in two bias-driven workplace dynamics. Number one, the obstacles to career advancement women encounter simply because they are women. And number two, the misunderstandings and stereotypes that face in they face in working with women whose social identities are different from their own, be it ra- of race, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, or parental status. Um, we have with us today uh, the author of the co-author of the book, Andy Kramer. It's not you; it's the workplace. So please stay tuned. Keep listening. Uh, we will do a deep dive into the the new book that's coming out here. Uh, But if you are a longtime listener, you do know that we always reserve just the first few moments of the show to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Houston and the Gulf Coast region when it comes to financial literacy. So we did have uh, we did have our Houston Money Week meeting this month. Uh, I've got a lot of things getting ramped up, and we're already in the kind of the planning stages. We've already started talking about the Houston Hispanic Forum Career and Education Day. That's even that's that's not even taking place to February 2020, but man, we are right here <laughs> at the end of the year. It's we're, Thanksgiving's coming up, December's coming up, and the, and then we'll be there. It's 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 crazy how fast uh, it goes. We've got those meetings that are just once a, a month for the partners. Um, and for people who aren't aware of Houston Money Week, the website HoustonMoneyWeek.org. It is a free um, workshop and initiative that's planned around National Financial Literacy Month. That's kind of Houston's answer to that. Um, however, it's it's grown into its own thing here. Uh, even though it's Houston Money Week, uh, most it's most of the last few years it's taken place for the entire month. We've had over 200 different free events uh, to the Houston, and it's grown into the Gulf Coast area, down into Galveston, up into the Woodlands. So it's kind of branched and sprawled out. Um, but we do offer free educational workshops. It could be around college planning. It could be around, um, I know a lot of the nonprofit partners that work with us do the VITA uh, sites. So for low to moderate income people that are uh, looking for help doing tax preparation, they will actually do tax preparation for free. Um, now you got to get that on your radar because it has to be before April, uh, before the deadline for your taxes to, to take advantage of it. But we have all kinds of free and great things going on um, for Houston. I, I would uh, get you to the website www.houstonmoneyweek.org org that is a dynamic uh, calendar and so what you'll see is there are some of the partners that do this stuff uh, every month and so you'll see that those events already on the calendar but I would encourage you to keep checking it because it's going to update the closer we get to April of 2020 uh, it, you'll see all of these other different events come online uh, my week's been kind of busy I had uh, four seminars this week which is not if I have four seminars in a month that's a, that's a big thing for me so we uh, uh, Saturday we did one on retirement income planning uh, out at a library out towards NASA uh, Wednesday night, we did social security strategies for women, um, and that was uh, in the evening, so that was at 6. Um, and then yesterday, I, I went out to Brazoria County and did money basic seminar for uh the employees of Brazoria County. We did that two different sessions. So kind of anytime there's uh, first responders or uh, uh, law enforcement officers, the the schedule's kind of crazy. So they have to break it up when people are uh, have time to, to come in to do the financial literacy piece. 
With that, uh, let's go ahead and get our guest on the air so we can maximize the amount of time that we have with Andy. Andy, are you there? I am, Chris. Glad to be here. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I usually will we'll start the show off with uh, a little bit about you as far as your bio. Uh, what would you, so, but, but let me turn it around. What would you like to share with us so that listeners can get to know you a little bit better? <clears throat> well, I have been a uh, practicing lawyer uh, for my whole career and uh, still do uh, still do report for duty. Uh, but um, that's my vocation. But my avocation has been trying to make it so that women can succeed in the workplace, uh, even though there's um, gender bias that we confront on a daily basis. And so for the last 30 years, that's a topic that I care very much about. I've been speaking and writing about it um, for most of that time and um, have two books out on the subject. Uh, the first one, Breaking Through Bias, and the second one, It's Not You, It's the Workplace, is the one that we're going to focus on today. And, and that came out in August. That came out in August. So it's 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 fairly new. That's the most recent book, but then we also had the uh, Breaking Through Bias book that, that came out as well. So this is your second book that's come out. Yes, that's correct. Excellent. Well, this is, it's a great topic. Um, I just finished doing the, uh, a talk on... Wednesday night about social security strategies for women, and one of the things that we run into that most people don't realize is because of the pay gap, um, it's about 70 cents on the dollar to what males put into the social security system. So this is a, um, uh, tell us, tell us how you got, because this is what you, you write about, how did you get interested in these issues? Well, the uh, interested in gender bias initially was that when I got out of law school, I started my career at a small firm where they couldn't have cared if you were purple polka dotted. If you did a good job, everybody wanted you on their projects. And then I joined a big firm, and they don't know you. They just know um, uh, what you look like. And if you look like a woman or you're a person of color or, you know, any number of different social identities, then they identify certain characteristics which, with you which have nothing to do with you. And so uh, what I found was that I went from an environment where um, people were uh, happy to work with you if you did a good job, they didn't care what you looked like, to people who assumed that because I was a woman, then obviously I wasn't as, and a, and a mother of a young child, that obviously I wasn't as committed to my career, which was not the case. Um, and that's really what prompted the first book, Breaking Through Bias, uh, which I wrote with both books with my husband. And um, uh, we still talk to each other, which is usually something people are curious about. Uh, <laughs> but um, in our second book, uh, It's Not You, It's the Workplace, about women um, uh, trying to deal with the workplace problems that women can have with other women, that grew out of our first book, where people would, women in particular, would come up to us and say, I can deal with the guys, but I hate working with the women. And that was a shock to me because I'd never had any personal experience with that. Uh, but when we started to peel the, you know, the layers of the onion back, what we found was that because of the stereotypes and biases that we all have about people, women, men, leaders, family, um, careers, that what happens is women and men carry those stereotypes into the workplace. And women react and interact with other women based on those stereotypes and the fact that workplaces are um, predominantly run by, controlled by senior men who have a culture that supports other men and is less welcoming to women. And so that's what prompted us to focus on women's relationships with women in the workplace. I want to ask you about the the is there a gender gap in women's representation in business? But some listeners may not even know what the gender gap is about. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, 
Um, you mentioned the pay gap, and when you said seventy about seventy plus cents on the dollar that women make, um, the the studies are are all over the board, but uh, that's a pretty good representation that for every dollar a man makes, um, a woman doing exactly the same job makes about seventy seven cents on the dollar. But that's a white woman. When we look at black women and Latina women or Hispanic women, um, uh, they make even less per dollar for the, as men do. So there's a wage gap to begin with. But the gap in representation is that um, notwithstanding the dramatic pay and um, career opportunity increases that women had in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, since the 1990s, uh, women's representation and senior leadership has been stalled in all of our organizations. So that, it, for example, we might have 10 or 12 percent women as CEOs of major companies, uh, less than 20 percent of women in senior uh, legal positions. Women graduate from medical school 50-50 with men, and they don't the senior leadership roles in the medical profession are all held, are, are, are significantly held by men. And it's not just the white-collar jobs. The same problems would happen if you're a fighter pilot or you're, a, uh, you know, on a construction, in, in a construction job, so that the senior positions are, are almost always go to men. And that puts women in a conflict situation with each other that men don't experience um, in their workplaces. So that you, we made some distinctions there right away because one of the things we talked about was the wage gap, and that's a piece of it. But another piece of it is just the representation. Uh, if you look at the, the CEOs, there's mostly men, and you talked about uh, the the progress that was made. But there, there after the '90s, there has been some stalled stalling there, stalled out as far as the equal representation. Um, has it been closing? Has the gap? What work has been done from that area? Well, there's little um, nibbling around the edges, Chris, where we'll see um, some improvement, and individual women can certainly um, feel that their careers have, have, are better than they would have been you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago. But statistically, the numbers have really not improved, so that we still have both a wage gap and a um, you know, representation gap in senior in in senior leadership roles across the the businesses and the professions in the United States. So I'm just going to, from a financial advisor's perspective, because I work with Social Security and retirees, uh, I'm in a unique position where you can fast forward to the end of your peak earning years. And uh, in reality, it, it takes women uh, 50 years to put in 40 years equivalent of men's earnings into the Social Security system. So it can it can play a, a huge role. And talking about it now, uh, getting it on the radar is, is huge. Um, why is that gap so persistent? Well, part of the persistence, I think, is the stereotypes in the biases that I, that I started with. So, for example, there's two types of biases that tend to hold women back in their career advancement. Um, one of them is the gender bias that I mentioned. And gender bias is basically, well, men are just better than women at, the, at certain tasks. That's the belief. That's not true, but that's the stereotype. And the bias that flows from it is, well, why would I pick Andy for a project if Chris is available? He's a guy. He's going to be better at it than she is, even if that has nothing to do with reality. Um, people think that. And so that's the gender bias piece. But we all have something else, which is, which the, which is referred to as affinity bias. And, and what that is is that people are more comfortable hanging around with, working with, advancing, supporting people who are like them. And it's not that people are inherently evil or bad-spirited or, or uh, bad-intentioned. It's just a, 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 something that we grow up with. And so because of both affinity bias and gender bias, men in senior leadership roles um, believe that they're being perfectly fair and considering men and women for 
important projects or involving them on, you know, important client or customer um, uh, involved relationships. But in reality, they have a predisposition to favoring people who look like them. And that hurts all women, but it also hurts people of color. So that's another distinction because we've heard a gender bias, but the affinity bias is, is, is there as well. And um, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's this uh, habit or this, this uh, thing that's in the background there that whether you acknowledge it or not, it's affecting you. <laughs> it's, right, exactly. It, it's there. Um, well, talk to, what is, what is gendered workplace? What does that mean? Well, in, in trying to describe a workplace where men are senior, um, are the senior leaders, the senior, the, the, the senior, the people in the C-suite, the, the people who are the partners, the people who are in control of the management of a company. Um, if they're mostly men, which is the case in most of our organizations, then workplaces are going to be gendered, meaning that men are going to, because of affinity bias and gender bias, they're going to tend to like to hang around with, if promote, advance, include other men. So masculine norms and values and cultures uh, permeate the workplace. And they don't do it as an intentional way of blocking women, but the result is that women can find themselves um, as outsiders, and by being an outsider, you don't get the same informal uh, career advancement opportunities that men do. Well, one of the things that you mentioned, even with the other book, was that you noticed this when you got into the uh, the different firms there after after law school, and you got into the firms. Uh, you had other women came coming up and telling you. Uh, that they were having a difficult time working with women as opposed to the men. Do, do gendered workplaces make it more difficult for women to work with other women than it does for men to work with other men? Yeah, absolutely. Now, here's the here. here I'll give you um, a, uh, an example to start with, which is when the very first time that a woman came up to me and said, "I get along fine working with men. I hate working with women." I asked her if she would explain that to me, and what she said to me was, "Well, I work with two. I report to two men, and I report to and I reported to three women, and the women were nasty. They were evil. They were only cared about themselves. They were cold. They were unfeeling. They were just bad. And the men are great. So I went to their boss, and I said to their boss, "I hate working with these women. I love working with the men." And the boss said, fine, just work with the guys. You don't have to work with the women anymore. So I said to her, well, that's really very interesting. Can you tell me, how did the women treat you differently from the way that the men treated you? And she was silent. She could not. I I wasn't sure if she was conscious, frankly. She just was quiet for so long. And finally, she said to me, she looked up and there were tears rolling down her face and she said to me, the women treated me exactly the same way that the men did, but I trashed their careers. And what's that about? Well, what happens is she looked up and she thought that the senior women were going to be like her mom or her sister or her best friend. And when she had a project that was due, the women would understand that she had to get the project done for the guys. Well, the women have the same pressures of getting their work done that the men do. And so they were expecting that um, the woman was going to give them as much attention on their projects as she was giving to the men, but she wasn't. And that's what gender bias does. Now, what a gendered workplace does is I'm the senior woman, and there's only one senior woman at the table. And if I go out of my way to help a younger woman on the way up, then there may not be a place for me. Because if there's one spot, she takes it from me. Men don't have to worry about one seat at the table. And so there's different dynamics that affect women working with other women that just don't happen with men when they're working with other men. And that's because the workplaces have are gendered and there is the gender bias. 
So, so there was almost a, an epiphany when you had to get her to put this into words, and she realized, well, I was kind of expecting the same thing, <laughs> a, a different, a different yeah, thing different. altogether. Um, and then you mentioned the idea of just had that one seat at the table again about representation, about that that, that men don't. There's a bigger uh, group there, and they don't experience just having possibly if you take the time to mentor or bring somebody up along with you that that may be the one seat at the table, and um, there's risk involved with that. Absolutely, absolutely. The other thing is that if I've made it into a senior management position, and I now go out of my uh, and I go out of my way to help a woman what happens is then they start to think that I'm I'm soft that I'm not you know that there's something wrong with me that I'm not giving it my all and so there's a uh, unfortunately there's a disincentive that if you if you help somebody who's like you who who's like you then um the if you're in the out group to begin with then there's a perception that there might be something you know, oh, she's, she, you know, she's not really tough on this, or she's she's being too flexible, or she she's just helping her because she's a girl, and so they, we have those issues that um, men obviously can support all the men they want, and nobody would would suggest that they're be, you know, that they're uh, acting as if they have some preference. That's exactly what you would call a double standard. <laughs> a very yeah. good example of a double standard textbook exactly. double standard. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You write about in the book. I'm going to pivot just for a moment because you you, sure. you also talk about something called intersectionality um, and the problems that women face with it, that they have different social identities. What do you mean by that? Well, I think you did a nice lead into that point um, when we started, Chris, because basically we all come to the to the workplace with more than just I'm a girl and you're a boy. We come to the workplace with suitcases full of um, identifications, uh, identities that we have. Uh, I may be a woman and you may be a man, but I may be old and you might be young. And you might be um, uh, straight and I might be LGBTQ. And you might be a a, a, a right-wing wackadoodle and I may be a left-wing wackadoodle. And you may have a small child at home and I don't. Uh, you may be black and I'm and I'm white, or you may be Latina and I may be um, I may be uh, uh, Asian, and so all of these different sorts of social identities means that we bring with us a whole packet of stereotypes, um, different bundles of stereotypes that affect how people deal with us, and so intersectionality is really an issue that very often people say, oh, well, why can't they all these women just get along together? You know, what, what's the matter with them? Well, the reality is that it's not all women in one bucket. Women are in all sorts of buckets, just the way men are. And so we have to deal with the fact that my workplace experience may be very different from yours if I'm a white woman and, and, and you're a black woman, because the reality is that I'm still white, and so I'm still going to be, um, uh, you know, able to identify with the, the white men in a way that a black woman wouldn't, for example, or an Asian woman would, wouldn't be able to. And um, uh, so that creates additional issues that women have in working with each other in the workplace. What can women do to heal or improve these relationships with other women? Well, I think the first thing is that women can, information becomes very powerful. Education is really important. And that's why um, having this conversation with you and your listeners thinking about this are really uh, important first steps. So understanding that we have stereotypes and biases, that we're not necessarily evil people, but that it's inevitable that we're going to have these suitcases full of beliefs that we're going to drag along with us, is really the first step. But the most important thing, then, is to move beyond that, because just understanding isn't going to solve the problem. What we need to do is we need to talk to each other, and that can be very difficult, because uncomfortable conversations 
are hard for everybody. But the way women are socialized, that we're supposed to be good girls, we're not supposed to get our dress dirty, we're not supposed to tear our tights, we're supposed to say please and thank you, we're supposed to raise our hand in class. All of these things socialize girls in a way that boys get a free pass on. And so for women to have a difficult conversation with another woman or a man is very uncomfortable for many women and more uncomfortable for women than it might be for a man. Again, just because of the way we're, we're, we're trained. And so what we need to do is we need to understand that and know that if we're going to have a difficult conversation, you know, my relationship with you, Chris, isn't going the way that I would like it to. What can I do better? I mean, I'd have to be prepared to have you actually tell me what I could be doing better. And if I try to have that conversation, well, all I'm going to do is try to defend myself with, I'm not a racist or some of my best friends are Asian, or whatever, um, that's not going to move the conversation forward. So we need to, we need to be prepared to, to take a risk, basically. So that, that was quite a bit you just said there. You, you, you talked about uh, education is important, so just starting the conversation and having the conversation is important, but it's not the only thing. Uh, that understanding it alone won't change it. You can understand the problem, but it's still there. Uh, and then having uh, that difficult conversation. Uh, so getting out of your comfort zone and, and, and really having that conversation with the idea that you may either learn or hear some things you don't want to hear or vice versa to the other person. Um, really taking that risk to get out there and, and, and have that uncomfortable, difficult conversation to, to, to address it. Um, from a business stance, if you had uh, something that you would like to tell uh, HR managers or the CFO, or, or because typically they're focused on the dollar signs, and yet this is a thing that is going on with their employees and their staff, what would you tell leaders of organizations how they could implement or, or, or make some of these changes? Well, although our book focuses um, primarily on, on what women can do, uh, we don't let men and organizations off the hook. And so we've developed a seven-step program for what organizations can do that basically work to take affinity bias and gender bias out of the process that evaluates people, that decides whether they're um, eligible for um, a promotion or what their compensation should be, for putting them on projects. And so I'll give you just one one example uh, which is beyond the education point that we've talked about, which is that um, it, it, symphony orchestras have um, gone from 10% women in the 60s to about 50-50% women um, now because they do their auditions behind a screen so that the people who are listening to the performers cannot see whether it's a man or a woman, whether it's a person of color, whether it's you know, doesn't, they don't know who's playing. It could be a, it could be a, you know, a, a, a pet dog that's playing, and they wouldn't know, um, other than the quality of the performance. But um, uh, and that's a, referred to as blind auditions, and that's a key thing. Obviously, in the workplace, you can't have um, evaluate people um, in a vacuum like that. But what we can do is. When somebody's applying for a job, we can strip out of the initial pass-through of their um, resumes or their, their biographies, their names, which may be a tip-off as to what their um, uh, ethnicity or their race is. Uh, we can get rid of things that, that show uh, definite gender. And it turns out that when you strip out those sorts of things, women and people of color get a better chance of being uh, brought in for an interview. It's just one example. So we have seven steps that we um, uh, suggest that organizations can do to, um, we can't change the way everybody thinks. What we have to do instead, instead is we need to take the bias out of the processes and the procedures that organizations implement. And yeah, I love it. We're right here at the end of the show. The book, It's Not You, It's the Workplace, Women's Conflict at Work and the Bias that It's Built, that It's Built It. 
uh, author Andy Kramer and co-author Alton Harris. Uh, book came out in August. And Thanks for listening to today's episode of Money Matters Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, visit us on the web at www.moneymatterspodcast.com. Drop us a line on SpeakPipe on the right-hand corner. Uh, it will receive any voicemails, questions, thoughts, concerns that you have about the show. In addition to this, we recently launched a Patreon campaign. Click on the Donate Now tab to hit the tip jar and find out what Patreon's campaign is all about.